A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul and Barnabas continued on for Pergia and reached Antioch and Poseida. On the Sabbath, they entered a synagogue and took their seats. Many Jews and worshipers who were converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them and urged them to remain faithful to the grace of God. On the following Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul said. But Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles were delighted when they heard this and glorified the word of the Lord. All who were destined for eternal life came to believe, and the word of the Lord continued to spread throughout the whole region. The Jews, however, incited the women of prominence who were worshipers and the leading men of the city, stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their territory. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. A reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, had a vision of great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. Then one of the elders said to me, These are the ones who have survived a time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they stand before God's throne and worship him day and night in his temple, the one who sits on the throne who shelters them. They will not hunger or thirst anymore, nor will the sun 
or any heat strike them. For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Febum Domine. Dominus Fabiscum, et Spiritu Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Gloria Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. Verbum Domini. Our prayers this morning are still with the people of Boston as they recover from the tragedy there, most especially with the families who lost loved ones and those parents who lost their little boy uh, who had just received First Holy Communion. We pray for those who are recovering from their injuries and for our nation, that the Lord will safeguard us and protect us from this type of harm in the future. Today is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and it is traditionally known as Good Shepherd Sunday. It is also, since the year 1963, known as the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. So today is the 50th World Day of Prayer for Vocations. Jesus, as the perfect fulfillment of salvation history, contains within himself the entire manner in which God had guided his flock, his chosen ones, throughout their history. And so if we look at the Old Testament, we see a series of priests, a series of kings, and a series of prophets. Priests uh, who were familiar with the sons of Aaron who uh, offered sacrifice and then the establishment of the the Levitical priesthood. They offered these holocausts, the, the burnt sacrifice, and they led the people in the worship of the one true God. In the series of kings, there's these men whom the people themselves asked to govern them. If we remember when Saul was placed over them, God responded 
through the voice of the prophets saying, you don't need a king like everybody else does, an earthly king like everyone else does, because I am your king. I am the one who governs you. And yet the people demanded, we want to be like everyone else. And so they got bad kings and bad kings and bad kings and a few good kings. Um, and these men ruled and governed God's people. And then we have a series of prophets who instructed the people in the ways of God and continually called them back to God challenge them to remain faithful. And just like ourselves today, the people did not listen to the voice of the prophet and say, oh, that makes perfect logical sense what you're saying. I have been disobedient to God. I will reform my ways and return to him. They raised their fist against God against the prophets. They picked up rocks against the prophets. They plotted for ways to get rid of the prophets so they didn't have to hear their voice. This is what Jesus would endure. This is what the prophet of today endures. And yet the people needed those men, those women, to continually call them back to God, to be faithful to him. And we see in the person of Jesus all of this that happened throughout the Old Testament, we see all of this brought to fulfillment, and we recognize in him <clears throat> one who is priest, prophet, and king. As priest, he made himself a holocaust. As both priest and victim, he offered once and for always the perfect sacrifice of expiation, the satisfaction for sin. And he restored the union between God and man. Because of Jesus, man may now speak to God in prayer as Father. This is what Jesus effected as priest. He is the perfect teacher, the perfect prophet, the fulfillment of all prophecy. We call him our Lord and our Master. We desire to sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen to his teaching. He is the fulfillment of all divine teaching, enlightening our minds and revealing the Father, making God known to us. The world rallies against him, against this teacher, rallies against this true prophet because the world does not want to conform or hear that teaching of God. Maybe they'll listen to it and be fascinated by it, but we do not want to truly uh, be called back to the ways of the Lord. But for those of us who have given our lives to Christ, do we not delight in sitting down at the feet of our Master? And as true King, Jesus reigns over our lives, and he reigns in our hearts. He leads God's flock by serving them. This is how the Lord reigns, through service. He has given us an order, and that is the commandment of love. And he leads us forward to conquer the world as a band of Christian warriors armed with the weapon of charity. We see all kinds of violence. We experienced in our nation this past week what it means to be terrorized, that we live in fear. And this is not the way that Christ designed for us to conquer the world. The one who believes is to live in freedom. The one who uh, believes has no fear. And we do not conquer the world with uh, weapons and bombs and all kinds of things that um, frighten and scare people or force individuals into a belief of God. But the world is won over by charity. It's taking, it takes a long time to make those kinds of advances. And yet we all know in our lives, we've seen in our own families, likely, and we can see in the witness of holy men and women who have lived in the past and in our own time, the
the tremendous advances that are made through love. That so many hearts are won over for the Lord. And this is what God desires. As we follow our king, as we follow our captain, uh, that we exercise this commandment of love. It's not easy. No, it's not easy to be a soldier fighting a battle. It's hard work. It's long hours. It's vigilance. And yet, step by step by step, the world is to be conquered in love. And all mankind is to be claimed for Christ Jesus and his cross. Now, each Christian, by merit of our baptism, has a share in the priestly, the kingly, and the prophetic identity of Christ. This participation is also true and especially manifest in the way that Christ continues to pastor his flock, the church, through the ministerial priesthood, through those called to be shepherds, namely bishops and priests. It is our duty by our very vocation to sanctify, to teach, and to govern God's people, to exercise those roles of Christ and how he shepherds. Again, what is the duty of a bishop, most especially, and of all priests? We are to sanctify, we are to teach, and we are to govern the people of God. And we do this in the very same way that Christ did. When we look at sanctifying God's people, it is in the person of Christ that priests offer the self-same sacrifice of Christ. It's the one true sacrifice of our redemption that is made present upon our altars. So one of the greatest things that a priest can do is to act in the person of Christ standing at the altar and also in the confessional, in the absolution of sin. And in ed every way in the sacramental uh, ministry that we perform. But we are to offer a holocaust of ourselves, uh, our, the surrender of our wills, that we live in perfect obedience and imitation of Christ on the cross. This is how he made us holy. This is how he sanctified us. And so where is the bishop supposed to be? Where is the priest supposed to be fully identified with Christ crucified? And then he serves all of you, or shepherds all of you and God's people by giving this witness and inviting God's people to do the same thing that each of us in our daily lives is to offer this holocaust of ourself. We are to surrender our entire will to the will of God. And then we offer this perfect sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Uh, we pray. And so that's what uh, the role of a priest is in the life of his people so much, uh, is instructing you and guiding you and helping you in your union with God that you can pray to him and speak to him as father because this is what Christ effected for us in his act of redemption that we are reconciled with our father and we can speak to him as his children this is how we become holy this is how we are sanctified and then in the teaching office, the obvious thing is that we are to instruct you and give instruction to the hearts of the believers. Now, as much as many of you dread the homily and the length of the homily, especially our poor friars who are here every day, and they have to live with us. And they sometimes, as they sit down and we start preaching, they say, yeah, 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 yeah. I hear that voice constantly nagging in my ear. And they're the ones who would say to us as priests, well, Father, beautiful words. Why don't you live what you say? <laughs> you know, so this is how the priest, the bishop and the priest are to uh, be those teachers, um, to be the prophet in our own time, 
to speak the truth, to call all of you back to fidelity to the Lord. Again, the first way we do that is by ourselves seeing and recognizing our obligation, our duty, our desire to be faithful to the Lord. But to speak to this world and to this culture that rejects this teaching, that doesn't always want to embrace Christ. But we do not desire to be embraced by this world, but to be embraced by God. And to speak that message, no matter what, to preach the gospel in the face of everything, to speak the truth so that believers may remain faithful to the Lord or be called back to the Lord. And as we receive this instruction that we come to know God, this is going to be, this will be the, the fruit of this will be our salvation, that we have this knowledge of God. And then finally, this role of governing. A lot of people get a little bit frightened when they hear that. I think because we sometimes have a warped view of what authority is. The priest, the bishop, does not come into the church like some little king. And if he does, then he's making some heir of his own. But the priest governs the way that Christ governs, by service by putting himself completely at the service of his flock, washing the feet of his disciples, laying his life down and dying for us so that we can have life, raising us up by his resurrection. Everything the Lord did as he governed God's people, as he pastored the flock of God, was being at our service, being at our feet. And this is a a challenge for us uh, as those who are ordained, as it would be to anyone, but again, to lead by witness and to lead by service. And then we uh, have to carry out this command or to preach this command, this rule from God himself, uh, the commandment of love. Uh, It means that we have to change. And this is where we sometimes feel a tinge of uh, someone's authority coming over us. We feel the authority of God who says, well, now uh, you need to love your brother or sister. It's like a parent who says to their child who's maybe acting up, and you say, you know, you need to share that with your sibling. Now, you feel that authority of the parent, you know if you don't share it, you'll definitely feel their authority. No, but what is is a parent asking us to do? To grow up, to act like a mature person, and more than that, to act like a follower of Jesus who shared his life with us, who shared his inheritance, eternity, with us as our brother. And so we imitate him Uh, in our lives. But if we look at the world and how the world often looks at the church in this, the ways that the church wants to oppress her people with her rules, this is how the world would look at that. And I would speak mostly of the moral teaching of Christ. It's important to remember that the moral teaching of the church is still Christ's command of love. And so if we look at three areas in particular, abortion, contraception, and gay, the gay marriage issue. Now this is where the news media looks at the Catholic Church and says, you know, that's got to change. You know, that's oppressive. That's authoritative. That's, uh, you know, kind of imposing on people's lives. My question would be, is it really, or is it your misunderstanding? Is this not really a teaching and exercise of the love of God, giving freedom to his people? You know, we say we have this right to abortion. What is the fruit of that? But the decimation of so many lives of the women who have felt forced that this is their only option. And beyond all of that, the killing of countless millions of innocent little children 
who have a right to the gift of life and the right to experience and know God in this life. And we think that we have the power to take that away. And so when the church says, this is a sin, and this is wrong, and this cannot be done, what is the church doing? What, the, the, we're, we're exercising the very rule of God himself to say, love your neighbor. Recognize the dignity of this little person, of this new soul whom I have loved into existence. This soul who I want to have the ability to know and love me in their life. We have no right to take that away. And yet that's the authority that the world is exercising. It's not something that the church is imposing. It's a death knell that the world is imposing upon so many innocent victims. When we look at the church's teaching on contraception, again, the media would look at the church and say, you got to get with it. you got to get into modern times here. You're imposing such a heavy, weighty rule upon your people. You're losing so many because it's impossible to live. That's a lie. How many of our Catholic faithful live this and say, we live this in full freedom. Again, why would Jesus teach us as our shepherd, as our king? Why would he say through his ministers, this is not permissible? Because he looks at a husband and wife and says, I understand what that union is. I'm the one who created that union between a man and a woman. I understand the intensity and the beauty of a lo the love between a husband and his wife. I understand it so well that I identified my relationship with the church, with my very people, as a husband with his wife, as a bridegroom with his bride. And don't be messing around with that. No, don't distort that understanding, or you'll distort the understanding of God's love for his people, where there is nothing, God holds nothing back for himself, but he gives himself completely to his spouse so that there may be engendered new life. You know, what the church understands in her teaching is not something that is oppressive, but again, a means to freedom and a means of respect between spouses. When we say it's not healthy for a husband or a, a wife to use the other partner, but to be at the service of one another, to be total in their love for one another. Because if you start playing around with that, marriages fall apart. Spouses feel uh, like they're being used, they're objects to one another and they've lost their identity as persons, as individuals. And finally, to look at the teaching on gay marriage, which is such an argument going on in our own time here in the United States. Um, again, the church is looked at as being archaic and not understanding at all. The priest, the bishop who speaks up on this, is not coming up with this teaching on his own. Again, when we provide a, a prophetic voice in the world today, we offer the very teaching that Christ himself gave. When we give this command or the rule of God, the moral teaching of the church, it's the same thing that comes from Jesus himself. You know, this is from the very... Uh, Early on, the, the apostles carried this out to us, and the church has developed her understanding of what Christ himself taught us. And so when we look just at one aspect of the issue of gay marriage or same-sex unions, again, it's degrading the very institution of marriage that God has given us. But even more so to look at the children 
that then want to be introduced into those unions. The church, in speaking this uh, command or this rule of lo the love of God, says those children are deserving of what only a mother and a father can provide. And who are we, again, in our little world and our great wisdom here to interfere with that and to make a mess of that? Uh, to look at the lives of these individuals, these men and these women, whom the church loves. Again, uh, the media would have you believe that every priest, every bishop hates any homosexual person, and that is a lie. You know, the priest, the bishop, as a representative of Christ, has the same disposition of Christ, loving each person and wanting for your good. And so to the homosexual person, we say, look at the facts of acting out. This is not to the person who struggles with the uh, homosexual tendency, but the one who's engaged the lifestyle. The level of, the percentage levels of depression, of suicide, of infidelity, are way beyond any other relationship indicators that this is likely not a healthy form of relationship or a long-term uh, relationship. And so the church, in her ministers, needs to and has an obligation to speak to this, uh, what seems just so wide-sweeping in our culture today, to provide that Again, what the world views as this oppressive rule or reign of the church imposing into the lives of her people. It's not imposing. Look what we sing in the responsorial psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Now, as true sheep of this shepherd, Jesus Christ, we sing that with joy in our hearts. We felt like little lambs. If I would have said, everybody get up and do whatever the Holy Spirit moves you to do while Lucas chants this little tune, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. We'd have all frolicked around like little lambs, kicking our feet and throwing our hands and saying, I belong to Jesus. You know, none of us is running away from wanting to belong to the Lord. So it's a, such a tremendous blessing that we have to be members of the flock of Christ and to be under his loving care. This is what uh, the church provides uh, in the person of Christ and in, in, in her ministers. Simply close with this reflection then on Good Shepherd Sunday. Notice that we don't have in the church any day that's called Good Carpenter Sunday. Jesus was not a shepherd in his trade while he was on earth, nor was he a fisherman. And yet these are the images that we have of Christ in his ministers. Those who are going fishing, you'll be fishers of men, so you have to keep going out and casting the nets and draw in more members to the flock. And then you're supp supposed to be this shepherd who takes care of those who have been entrusted to you and to watch after them. You know, it doesn't mean that Jesus dissed his uh, profession that he learned from St. Joseph. But what is Jesus? He's the son of, of Joseph and Mary, and he's the fulfillment of the prophecy given to David that your son will sit upon the throne forever and govern God's people. That's Jesus Christ. And Jesus governs God's people as a shepherd king. King David, before he was a king, was a boy out in the, the fields, and he knew what it meant to be up late at night and to be vigilant and to throw himself, willing to throw himself uh, to danger or to death for the sake of his flock. And these are the traits that he brought in to his um, rule then as king, as shepherding God's people. And Jesus is the perfection of all of that. 
always watchful, always attentive to what is for our best, for our good, wanting his flock to be truly happy and at peace, and willing at any moment, as he did, lay down his life for our life. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With Our Lady of Hope, we rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus and ask the Father for all our needs. That our Holy Father and his fellow bishops and priests may be filled with the spirit of truth and holiness as they lead the people of God in hope and renewal of life. We pray to the Lord. Lord that the church may always be a sign of God's love, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our that we may look upon the poor, the vulnerable, the stranger, and the unborn with the unconditional love and welcome portrayed by the gospel, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our that those who work in the audio, visual, and print media may witness to the truth and be effective communicators of God's love, we pray to the Lord. That the Lord will protect all widows, orphans, and refugees throughout the world, we pray to the Lord. <clears throat> that young people who have left home and family in search of deeper satisfaction may discover the all-embracing love of the Father, we pray to the Lord. <clears throat> that all who have fallen asleep in Christ may arrive in their homeland of heaven, we pray to the Lord. And on this world day of prayer for vocations, we pray that Christ, our good shepherd, may provide for his church many holy priests and uh, consecrated religious, we pray to the Lord. Lord we pray for the health and strength of all those in recovery in Boston. We pray for the consolation of those who mourn the loss of loved ones, we pray to the Lord. Lord God of peace, who raised up from the dead the great shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ, grant to us the graces we need to carry out your holy will. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord.
brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that we may always find delight in these paschal mysteries, so that the renewal constantly at work within us may be the cause of our unending joy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time above all to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For with the old order destroyed, a universe cast down is renewed, and integrity of life is restored to us in Christ. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, Every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Robert, our Bishop and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. <clears throat> in humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel, to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. <coughs> Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through him you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. Precepti salutaribus moniti, et divina institutione formati, audemus dicere. Pater
Libera nos quasimus domine ab omnibus malis, da propitius pacem in diebus nostris, ut opi misericordiae tui aduti, et epicatus simus semper liberi, et ab omni perturbatione securi, expectantes beatum spem, et adventum salvatoris nostri, Jesu Christi. We come to a best regular net for Domine Jesu Christe, quid existi apostolis tuis, pacem relinquo vobis, pacem meam do vobis, nede specias peccata nostra sed fidem ecclesiae tuae, eam quae secundum voluntatem tuum, pacificati ad quadunare digneris, qui vivis a regnas in secula seculorum. Domini sit semper vobiscum. Et cum spiritus ruo. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The Good Shepherd has risen, who laid down his life for his sheep, and willingly died for his flock. Alleluia. For those who cannot now receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, we offer the following prayer. O Jesus, since I cannot now receive thee under the sacramental veil, I beseech thee with a heart full of love and longing to come spiritually into my soul through the immaculate heart of thy most holy mother and abide with me forever, thee in me and I in thee, in time and in eternity, in Mary. Amen.
Let us pray. Look upon your flock, kind shepherd, and be pleased to settle in eternal pastures the sheep you have redeemed by the precious blood of your Son, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Dominus vobiscum, et benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, pater et filius et spiritus sanctus. Amen. Amen.